Okay, so this field trip is kind of in lieu of field trips that were planned. Venues are shut down, no place to park. Tried to get into El Moro Canyon and to um, Crystal Cove area and you just can't get in there at all. All the areas parked. This area here is also closed too. I had to kind of talk the sheriffs into letting me in here because I guess last weekend they had 400 cars here. And so this region that we're going to look at is in San Diego Canyon, which is up in the Santa Ana Mountains. And in particular, we're going to take a look at this sandstone formation here. Unlike the Monterey Formation, these sandstones here are very well compacted. The little holes that you see in these sandstones are due to groundwater. As groundwater travels through the quartz sand, it's pretty porous. Rounded sand grains have a lot of void space in between them, even though they're compacted. This rock is pretty porous and allows water to transmit to it fairly easily. But when water travels through this rock, it has a tendency to carry dissolved minerals like calcite and salts. As these salts precipitate on the surface of the sandstone, due to the water evaporating, leaves behind the salts, the calcites, the alkalines, the crystals tend to grow, and as they grow, they displace the sand, forming these little pockets. So over time, these pockets get larger and larger. So here's a good example of some of those pockets. This sandstone is very well layered, and it's kind of debatable if this is wind blowing or there's been aided water. So a lot of the Monterey Formation, and a lot of formations of coastal California, even in the foothills of the Santa Ana Mountains here, are very aquatic. So these are very shallow continental shelves that stuck out during most of the late Cenozoic. That's what California was, is a very broad continental shelf. And that shelf then wound up getting pushed up onto the North American continent. So imagine at one time that this was a coastal area. This is probably not within water, but it had heavy influence from water. So this is kind of a rare spot. The sandstone out here, this is a quartz-rich sandstone, kind of a yellowish white color, and then intermittent in between there, there's a layer there where it's very conglomeratic. So you see it's a lot of conglomerate here in this sandstone here. So within the sandstone, you'll find conglomerates. And then when you go down a little bit and look at the sandstone itself, this part of it is very well layered. So you have a very well layered sandstone. So this is probably a coastal area, but it was out of the water. These were most likely sand dunes that you'd see along extensive beach areas. And the composition of these sandstones varies. Very, very fine grained sand in some areas to conglomerate it in others. So it's kind of a sandstone in some areas and conglomerates in other. Very hard to hold the video camera still when you're really close. Need a camera person out here and a tripod. So this is probably the, the sandstone the next area we're going to stop, the sandstones are actually red in color, as over in the hills in the background here. Those sandstones are actually kind of a red color. And I'm going to take a stop and look at those, and we'll explain why those are red. Up the road a little bit. This, believe it or not, it's the same formation. You'll notice that the lower sandstones towards the river, towards the wash area, are white in color. And then as we move up the hill, the sandstones are red. So the red colorization is due to iron oxidation. There's a little bit of controversy on how the sandstones became red. One theory is that the sandstones were all red, all oxidized with iron due to groundwater or at the time of deposition, there was sufficient iron oxidizing these rocks red. The other theory 
is that they were white and then dyed with iron or they were red and then groundwater leached out the iron oxide leaving them white. And in some areas you'll see, especially in Utah, probably one of the best sandstones in the world, though the sandstones are very, uh, they have like a wave-like pattern between reds and yellows and whites. It's kind of hard to explain and that almost looks like the sandstone was later oxidized by groundwater. So if we take a close-up look at these sandstone units, you'll see they're definitely linear. Nice linear pattern to them. Tilted sandstones. So these formations at one time were flat, horizontal, and now they're tilted. And this is all due to the tectonic activity which placed these sandstone units up into the Santa Ana Mountains. So at one time, this is coastal area. This would have been down in the lower parts where the cities of Tustin and Orange are. This unit has been thrusted due to continent-to-continent -continent collision when microcontinents attach themselves to the North American continent. So as we move across the valley now, you're gonna see that the rock type changes dramatically. So this is the Santa Ana Mountains. You can see the power lines going up and down the sides of the hills. As I pan over, there's a hill with a cross on top of it. And where that cross is, that rock is actually granite. This granite was formed during the very, very late Jurassic, early Cretaceous. So this is right at the end of the Mesozoic. These granites were part of a subduction zone. So these granites were the result of the Farallon Plate, which subducted underneath the North American continent. It melted, cooled, forming this crystalline granitic rock, and then later it was uplifted about the same time that all of the red and white sandstones were pushed in. These units here also uplifted. This uplift that started right around 65 million years ago. So on our last field trip, we went to the Bolsa Chica wetlands. The Bolsa Chica wetland, as I said in that field trip, very important area. This is where water from the land drains across into the wetlands and it's kind of an intermixing of salt water from the ocean and water runoff from the continent. So here is a typical wash. This is part of the Santa Ana watershed. So the watershed that feeds the Bolsa Chica Reservoir, the Bolsa Chica region, is part of the Santa Ana watershed. And that watershed starts here. So you have to realize that all the sediment that's being carried down into the basins is carried down through a series of streams like this one. This one here is fairly active today because we've had some recent rains. As I will explain on our next field trip, or one of the future field trips, we are losing our beaches because we are damming rivers and streams like this. As we dam these rivers, the primary purpose is to create watershed so that we can store water for use during non-raining season, summertime. Ranchers have been doing it for years up here. They've been damming rivers, and the rivers do hold a good amount of water. The problem is, is when you dam a river, not only do you hold back the water, you also hold back the sediment. So the fine-grained sand that is deposited in the oceans at the mouth of the Santa Ana River is being held back in these canyons. This canyon here does have a dam upstream, and I'll show you on the field trip when we revisit the Santa Ana Mountains, when we go to Tucker Wildlife Preserve, that this dam is completely filled in with sediment. And I'll give you a little timeline on that. So you have one more little stop here. We're gonna look at a road cut here, and then we'll terminate this field trip. Here's kind of a unique setting. One side of the road 
the rocks are granitic. You go to the other side of the road, and the rocks are sandstones. So you have sandstones on one side, granites on the other. So anytime you see a, an abrupt contact like that, and when you look at the rocks here, they're extremely angular. They're tilted. This tilting represents obviously a lot of tectonic activity and the fact that we find granitic rocks right abruptly against igneous rocks, granites, that tells you that there's been an awful lot of amount of tectonic activity in this area. So this is uh, in the Sandon Mountains. So we have to realize that the Sandon Mountains here have been um, subject to a lot of tectonic compression when continents were colliding. Now, instead of being compressed, this landscape is now being ripped apart. And at the same time, it's being downcut by rivers. So the Santa Ana Mountains are here primarily because of compression technology. And now they're being pulled back apart due to extensional tectonics from the San Andreas Fault, which has a combination of both shear and tension. Shear, side-by-side -side movement of the different faults like the San Andreas, the San Jacinto, the Newport Inglewood. And at the same time, extensional tectonics because the landscape is being stretched and pulled. So these mountains were first compressed, pushed up, and then they're being pulled back down again. And in between all that, rivers are actively cutting down through the rocks. You can see here there's a combination of granite boulders, combination of some sandstones, whole variety of rocks in this river. There's even some metamorphic rocks. And so there's a large variety of rocks in the Santa Ana Mountains. And because these mountains have had a very complex history and we'll re revisit the Santa Ana Mountains in one of our future field trips. And we'll enter entertain some more questions then. So have a good day, stay safe. We're trying to do the best we can to provide you an education. Virtual field trips, I guess that's the best we can do.